Hello, uh, welcome to this introduction to the dragonflies breeding in the county of Devon in the UK. I'm going to talk uh, through the damselflies and dragonflies that we know breed regularly in the county. And I'm going to deal first of all with those widespread species and their common habitats and then finally the scarcer species to be found and what habitats they prefer to live in. I think before I go on I should add that there is another video on YouTube which will introduce you to the dragonfly and damselfly biology and their ecology and uh, so there's uh, the title of it, An Introduction to Britain's Dragonflies. So let's put Devon's dragonflies into a global context. Well, we know there are over 6,300 species, probably substantially more than that, awaiting description. Most of these live in the tropics and uh, as with other organisms, but particularly insects, there are far fewer of these living in temperate regions. The further north and south you go away from the equator, the less diverse um, animal communities become. And that's certainly true of dragonflies. There are about 150 or maybe less than 150 species breeding in Europe. And of these, about a third, 48, breed in the UK, on top of which we can add nine species that have occurred as vagrants, wanderers from uh, well outside the UK. In Devon, we have a fair proportion of those, 29 breeding species, that's roughly half damsels and half dragonflies. And then again, we have had nine species occurring as vagrants, two of which have actually laid eggs, the uh, lesser emperor and vagrant emperor, but we have no proof of successful breeding of those. And sadly, we've lost one, the orange spotted emerald. Um, there's a picture of a, a young female, so you know what it looks like. Please do keep an eye open for them. You never know. Um, these occurred on the River Tamar in the 1940s, and the only record, in fact, is of a couple that were caught and preserved for posterity. So the damsels and dragons, we can break down roughly into a dozen groups, six damselflies and six dragonflies. So you'll see on the left there, uh, smaller, bluer species, the blue tails, the blue damsels, and the red-eyed damsels. And then to the right of them, the demoiselles, the emerald damselflies, and the red damselflies. On the right, we can break down the dragonflies into chasers, skimmers, and darters. And then on the right, hawkers and emperors, those big robust flyers, um, the golden ring dragonfly and emerald dragonflies. In fact, in Devon, only the downy emerald. So let's have a look at what species make up those groups. So first of all, the damselflies, we've got two species of blue tails, four species of blue damsels, two different red eyes, two demoiselles, just the one emerald damselfly, and two species of red damsels. So you see I've underlined three of those species. These are red listed. So these are rare in Britain. And uh, we have um, some responsibilities for keeping an eye on them and making sure their populations are healthy. Dragonflies, we only have one red listed dragonfly, and that's one of the three chaser species. We have two skimmers, four darters, 
one of which may or may not breed, or in fact two of which may or may not breed every year. And then we have um, three species of hawker, the emperor dragonfly and the hairy dragonfly. So there's a lump together as big flying uh, dragonflies, flyers, as opposed to perchers, that is. Uh, just the one golden ringed dragonfly and the downy emerald. So Devon's dragonfly habitats are, to be honest, mostly artificial in origin. And some of the more important ones down at the bottom of that list are um, mostly natural in origin, although to some extent they may have been influenced by the, the tin and clay mining that's gone on, particularly on Dartmoor, to a much lesser extent on Exmoor. So ironically, lowland rivers and streams, which of course are essentially natural in character, um, don't have many species attached to them specifically um, or, or tied solely to, to flowing waters, um, just a few. And um, we lack some of the rarer species associated with flowing water that are found elsewhere in southern Britain and indeed even more so on the continent. But we have a good range of still water uh, habitats. Anyway, I'm going to start going through these. I'll start first with ponds. So your average garden pond uh, would be expected to host, I think, in southern England, in Devon, at least half a dozen species. And that's provided it's a reasonable size. This one covers roughly 15 square metres. And it's said that that sized pond could host a fair proportion of Britain's breeding dragonflies. So one of the commonest pond damselflies is the large red. And this species is the first dragonfly species to emerge generally in, in spring. And typically in April, you can see here I've highlighted the fact that there are black areas on this to differentiate it from the much rarer small red damsel, which you wouldn't expect to find at a garden pond. And uh, you'll see the black legs, those black, shiny black markings on the tip of the abdomen and the black wing spots are characteristic of this species as well, of course, as it's essentially red abdomen. The female has a more or less red abdomen. There are three different types of um, female coloration. Multiple colors, uh, or multiple variations is common amongst the damselflies. And here you can see a, a typical one with some areas of black as well as red and yellow stripes. Another very common species indeed, one of the most widespread species in Britain, is the blue-tailed damselfly. And you can see here um, its characteristic blue tail, although it is actually not terminal. It's, uh, it's on segment eight rather than segment nine or ten, which would be at the tip. And the wing spot there uh, in the forewings is very obviously black and white. It's two-tone and uh, the hind wings rather less so, and indeed that's also the case with the female. But in the males, quite conspicuous and quite diamond-shaped wing spots. Here are a couple of different forms of female blue tails. They come in quite a range of different thorax colors. Some of these also have the blue segment eight. In others, it's brown and very hard to see. The colors of the thorax sometimes vary with age. So they may start off, for example, as these colors and end up another one. All rather confusing, but it's helpful to look for that segment eight blue or slightly pale patch, as well as the slightly two-tone wing spots. 
So you can see this, the female in this pair of blue tails mating um, has got a rather dull blue segment eight patch and a rather somber abdomen, uh, sorry, thorax color. And those two-toned pterostigmas, if we want to use the technical term. And of course, remember also that blue-tailed damselflies mate for longer than other species of damselfly. So they may be mating for several hours and typically in late afternoons. So the chances of seeing these uh, mating in late afternoon is very high, uh, whereas other damselflies tend to mate particularly in the mornings. The azure damselfly, I like to call the snooker player, and you'll discover why in a moment, but it's one of our two um, common species of blue damsel. And the azure is particularly common at ponds and also in ditches and maybe around the margins of larger waters. It has a narrow blue stripe on top of the thorax that's narrower than the black stripe below it. It has what uh, you might call a bow tie. Sometimes it's rather more obviously the shape of a, a dicky bow than this particular one. And of course, a snooker player uh, worth his salt will be wearing a bow tie. He may also be carrying a beer glass. And uh, um, sorry to be stereotypical here, but uh, you can just perhaps make out the square U shape uh, which is a reasonable cross-section of a straighter, straight-sided beer glass. The common blue damsel is the other common species of blue damselfly in Devon and indeed across the whole of Britain, one of our most widespread species in fact, and sometimes to be found in huge numbers at the larger ponds and lakes where it is most common. So these we tell from the azure by having a broad blue stripe. So you'll notice it's broader than the black stripe below it. And that's really quite a, an easy thing to see, especially with a pair of binoculars. But it gives an overall more blue appearance to this than the azure. And then at the tip of the abdomen, there are two completely blue segments. So no sign there of a, a bow tie pattern. So let's just look at these from a slightly different angle. The azure here with its narrow blue stripe, its beer glass, also carries a billiard cue. So a little spur of black on the side of the thorax, which helps us to remember that it's not this species, the common blue. So you see the common blue has that broad blue stripe again. Um, it has a mushroom or apple shape, rather hard to see usually because it's hidden by the wing bases. Um, so it has that shape instead of a beer glass. And it lacks that billiard cue on the side of the thorax, making it look a very blue thorax. And then again, refreshing the rear end of these two damsels, the bow tie pattern on segment nine of the azure damsel, but completely blue in the common blue. The females, a little bit trickier to identify, but made a lot easy, easier because the thoraxes have the same patterns, the narrow stripe and the billiard cue on the azure, the unmarked side and the broad stripe on the common blue. Common blue also has what I think of as dandere rocket shapes. Um, those of a certain vintage will know what I mean by those, but uh, these, these are a rather um, classic form of a rocket back in the 1950s and 60s when I was reading a comic called um, The Eagle in which Dandere featured. Again, remember with these, like the other damselflies I've mentioned so far, the color of the base of the base colour of the abdomen will vary 
these are quite blue examples sometimes they can be a lot duller buffer browner or olivey the broad-bodied chaser is a specialist of um, the early stages of wetlands so if you dig a hole in the ground in the spring fill it with water I have often said um, there's a good chance that within an hour a male broad-bodied chaser will have found it and maybe set up a territory there it won't always happen of course like that but they are extremely good at finding new ponds and will readily wander into gardens they're well named of course they have a very broad abdomen they also being a chaser have very conspicuous dark wing bases as there's a female again showing those dark wing bases and the broad abdomen um, but you'll see she has this ochre very bright ochre and yellow sided abdomen and uh, some people are alarmed by seeing these well away from water at times um, when they pitch up land on a bramble perhaps in a in a woodland clearing looking rather hornet like you will also note that this individual the hind wings are misshapen these have failed to expand properly on emergence although she was still perfectly able to fly and probably able to mate and lay eggs too whereas the broad-bodied chaser is a spring emerging spe species common data emerges during the summer and indeed will persist well into the autumn and even into early winter we have uh, December records of these the very earliest ones in very warm parts of Devon may emerge in late May but most of these you will see on the wing during uh, late July August September and, and October they're identified um, partly by their orangey red abdomen of course but also by these two conspicuous yellow panels on the side of the thorax with a darker in this case red but getting darker as they get older panel in the middle they also have brownish looking legs rather than black looking legs and that's partly because they are off black they're not quite black and they have pale stripes sometimes quite obviously yellow striped legs this is a female common data quite a young one the wing spots are still rather pale and um, in fact this looks um, pretty much identical to an immature male as well uh, one of the things to look out for on female darters is this pair of dark lines down the segments towards the tip of the abdomen the markings on the rest of the abdomen are not dissimilar to the female and immature male keeled skimmer that we'll see later on however when they get older they darken gradually this is a particularly dark individual some will actually go reddish um, so this was taken in October and she came to uh, bask on my hand uh, to get warmth here are a couple of males again also photographed in late October when they came and sought a little bit of human warmth although they're more readily seen on bits of bare ground often timber benches and the like and indeed remarkably might even land on the right colored baseball cap so the southern hawker is one of our largest dragonflies it's quite commonly encountered at garden ponds and other ponds particularly wooded ponds as well and the males are quite brightly colored a um, lot of black or dark brown patterning but uh, you'll see some yellow and greenish and blue markings there on top of the thorax two very large patches of yellow 
and these I think of as the headlights. But this species also has tail lights, very conspicuous, broad um, bands across the tip of the abdomen. And these are unique to this species in Britain. Much less easy to see is this yellow triangle, rather resembling a golf tee on the back, uh, the base of the abdomen. And there you can see a male in flight. They are very territorial and indeed quite inquisitive. They will come and challenge you as a human if you come and uh, stand on the edge of their territory, on the edge of their pond and uh, just uh, suss you out. And that gives you adequate time to look at their um, headlights and tail lights, which are very obvious there. And also extensive area of yellow green on the side of the thorax. Female similarly patterned, although the colours are rather more chocolate brown and lime green. Here's one uh, laying eggs into rotten wood on the edge of a pond. It's a hawker habit to lay eggs just outside the reach of the water. Um, I think probably because they're laying in late summer and early autumn which is when these things are normally found, they will be anticipating a rise in water level during the autumn and winter. So this is the first of several maps I'm going to show. They're not totally up to date, but actually have records up to 2012. But the, the idea on this is to show the red dots here, which show all of the occurrences uh, 10 kilometer squares, in fact, where it has only occurred since the year 2000. So these show signs of recent spread, both northwards and westwards. The blue dots, the dark blue dots, show where it's been recorded both before and after 2000. And this uh, short video clip shows a female laying eggs. You can see she's not close to water um, and is rooting round in amongst the mosses and leaf litter looking for somewhere damp suitable to lay her eggs. So now let's look at some lakes, larger ponds. This example in uh, southeast Devon being very good for dragonflies, one of our best sites in the county. And as I said earlier, common blue damselflies can be really quite abundant at locations like this. So you can see here a pair in tandem. This is a video clip showing the surface of Stover Lake. And here you can see mostly common blue damselflies flying en masse over the water. There are a few egg laying blue damsels which could possibly be a sewer but may well also be common blue damselflies. Emerald damselflies, these are the rule breakers because they hold their wings out at 45 or maybe 60 degrees to their body. And as the name suggests, the males are this lovely emerald green, although there are powder blue areas, areas that become pruinose at the base and tip of the abdomen. Females rather more somberly coloured, but also shiny, bronzy green. And the males tend to go a bronzy green colour as they get older too. The emperor dragonfly, uh, largest dragonfly in terms of wingspan and readily identified um, between late May when they tend to emerge en masse uh, right through these days into August or even September. But certainly large, brightly coloured dragonflies hawking endlessly at about shoulder or head height over a pond, a largish pond 
during the summer, uh, early spring and summer months is going to be an emperor. So you can look out for that completely green thorax and the abdomen, which from the sides looks essentially blue. Although there is, as you'll see, a black stripe down the middle. And that blue on the side of the, of the abdomen looking very obvious as they're in flight. Often a slightly droopy abdomen. And you can also see on this one the yellow costa, the wing vein at the front of the wings, is decidedly bright. Black-tailed skimmers, um, the first of the skimmers we're looking at, skimmers do as it says on the tin. The black-tails particularly will skim low over water um, rather erratically and then land pitch up on a territorial perch. So the male's behaviour um, is quite characteristic actually. They always perch on the ground, almost invariably anyway, perch on the ground and uh, often on pale um, surfaces, uh, including wood uh, like this, but often it'll be patches of mud, the black tip to the tail, uh, the lack of any black in the wing base tells us it's not a chaser. And the map here shows considerable northward spread of this species over the last 20 years or so. Four spotted chaser. Well, we know it's a chaser because it has those dark triangular bases to the hind wings. Um, both male and female are similarly colored in this species, which is rather unusual and unlike the other chasers. They do, however, have these very distinctive extra black spots on the wings. So halfway along the wing at the node, there is a black spot that gives the species its name. It also occurs um, in a slightly darker form with dark suffusions towards the tips of the wing and also around the nodes. And these, like other dragonflies, will go duller with age and become quite olivey brown in colour. The migrant hawker is our latest emerging dragonfly, emerging from water, from ponds um, around the end of July and into August, and then flying into the autumn, even into November. They're quite small, about the same size as the hairy dragonflies which fly in spring, but of course these are going to be flying later in the year. There's the map again showing considerable northward spread of this species. But fairly widely distributed in Devon, again at larger, often reedy edged waters. So the males will fly sometimes several together. They're not very territorial, unlike other many other dragonflies. They, you often see a lot together and they'll go in and out of reeds and other emergent vegetation, essentially looking for females to mate with. So they're identified by having side lights as opposed to headlights on main beam. They also have a rather more um, obvious golf tee pattern than the southern hawker, although you need to be seeing these from just the right angle to get that. And from the side, looking quite blue on the abdomen, but also with equal amounts, let's say, of brown and yellow on the side of the thorax. So not as yellow on the side of the thorax as the southern hawker. And when they hover, which they do quite often, they'll stay in one position. They hold their abdomen up up tilted like this rather characteristically. This is Decoy Lake, a rather deep lake, but you can see with a fringe of trees. And this is the favoured habitat of a very localised lake dragonfly, 
the downy emerald. Now the downy emerald, as its name suggests, is quite downy on the thorax. It's also emerald green at the front end, those lovely green eyes, though a little bit bronzy on the abdomen. You can see the abdomen is distinctly bulbous at the tip and it holds that, like the migrant hawker in fact, it holds that elevated um, in flight, giving it a very characteristic shape. But this is a fairly small dragonfly emerging in mid-May from a few locations in Devon and um, the males will fly for long periods up and down a shoreline hovering in little um, bays looking for females. So there's that bulbous tip which you need to look out for. The hairy thorax, like the four-spotted chaser, which is also quite hairy, is a, an adaptation to help them warm up in the spring and it um, retains heat better when they're basking. And there's the map. You can see we just have a few locations, the Bovey Basin pits, the clay pits in the Bovey Basin and lakes there and a couple of sites on the East Devon pebble bed heaths. Here's a short clip showing a, a newly emerged female. Her eyes are still rather brown, the wings very glossy, and there you can see her exuvia underneath the yellow flag stem. This is at a pond at Stover and you can see she's a couple of meters away from the water's edge. That's not unusual for these. And they're the typical habitat here. A lot of them emerging actually in those overhanging trees you can see there on the left, but also in the vegetation around the edges. Another Bovey Basin clay pit here, but one um, showing water lilies, not a native species of water lily, but nevertheless perfectly good for the red-eyed damselfly. So another rather localised species, one that seems to be spreading slowly. Um, but you can see here, unlike the blue-tailed damselfly, it has blue right at the tip of the abdomen and a very dark top to the thorax. There are red eyes, but they're not the only species with red eyes. The, uh, the large red damselfly, of course, also has red eyes. But I think you can see here also the abdomen is slightly pruinose, so a little um, blue-gray flush along the abdomen, so not solidly dark. And quite a robust species that is almost invariably seen using binoculars is best um, on lily pads or floating pond weeds. So their locations are um, rather scattered, again in the Bovey Basin and East Devon, but also around the head of the Ex Estuary and on the Exeter Canal and the Grand Western Canal. This is a new kid on the block. The small red-eyed damselfly first hit Britain in 1999, and within a few years they had found Southeast Devon and they've now spread quite well in, in southeastern England and got into South Wales too. So they're likely to be turning up at lots of places, although this one is on a water lily. They're not by any means restricted to water lilies. Any floating vegetation, uh, including uh, algal mats, they will appear on. So I think they're probably going to turn up at lots of ponds and maybe other wetland areas um, if they're not already there now and we haven't found them. So something to keep an eye open for. They're worth looking for in late summer. So these emerge um, in late June. So red-eyed damselflies have already been on the wing for over a month at this stage. So they're late, late comers. They're a little bit smaller, certainly a bit more slender than the red-eyed damselfly and best identified to be honest, by looking for this wedge of blue um, underneath, on the side of, of this abdominal segment, which is lacking in the red-eyed. They also have this black cross on the terminal segment, 
but that's really rather hard to see. Here's the red eyed for comparison, just to show you the difference in position of blue at the tip of the abdomen. And there's the map, nearly all red dots, of course. So pretty well all of those um, post 2000. And in fact, as I said before, these are slightly outdated maps and we have more locations further into Devon in Torbay and they've even found their way into Cornwall. Here's a pair in tandem on an algal mat, actually on a ditch on Exminster Marshes. So not a typical location. These may have strayed from Exeter Canal. Um, they're not, as you can see, egg laying, they're just resting and in fact have then got sent off by that pond skater. This is a fairly new pond, just uh, two or three years old, very shallow on the top of what used to be a gravel pit and has now been uh, tipped on and capped with this pond just hanging in there. This was a location in 2020 where this rather handsome species turned up. In fact, a number of immatures turned up nearby first and then three or four males took up territory on the pool here. Um, whether they bred or not, uh, we're not sure. But this is certainly a species that's increasing in Britain. It's still primarily a migrant, um, but it's also uh, a disperser. And on emergence, the um, tenorals tend to fly away from that water and maybe uh, not come back to it later. So they have rather short lived populations. We've had a few instances of breeding for one or two years at places in South Devon. And we're hoping that we might get a permanent population uh, someday. So the red veins are fairly obvious, um, rather more easy to see when they're flying around, which they do a lot. Although they have territorial perches, often on the very tip of a, a tall stem, they do patrol quite a lot over water. And you can, through binoculars, see that pale oblique stripe on the side. And when they rest, you can also look out for this very pale wing spot with very obvious black margins, front and hind. And also, if you're at the right angle, catch a glimpse of the blue under the eyes, which is a, a feature unique to this amongst the darters. So there's the map, very widespread of records, mostly coastal, which is what you would expect from a migrant. And here a female, again, the immature males look similar color, albeit slightly different shape. Um, but one thing to note on these is the rather slightly blue green hint to a very pale side to the thorax. They also have quite extensive blue under the eyes. And again, those very obvious pale wing spots with dark, very bold, dark edges. So let's look now at lowland rivers. So these would be rivers generally with a rather muddy organic uh, bottom um, where certain species will live. And one of the obvious ones along these low lying rivers, rather mature stretches of river and streams also, is the banded demoiselle. So well named, the male has this band of color across his wings. These are large damselflies fluttering rather like butterflies over the water, sometimes in quite large numbers. By contrast, on the faster flowing rivers and streams where the bottoms are more gravelly, uh, you will be looking for the beautiful demoiselle. This again is a male and virtually the whole of the wing is, is dark. Um, so again, this fluttering flight over water courses makes them quite conspicuous. Let's look at their distributions. So as we might expect, 
The beautiful demoiselle has a rather southwesterly distribution, very widespread in Devon, and like the banded demoiselle, actually often wandering away from watercourses. So sometimes found uh, up to a kilometre away from water. And here, by contrast, the banded demoiselle showing a much more localised distribution in Devon and associated with the lowland stretches of rivers um, and the river Tamar, where because of the muddy substrate, it does venture quite a way up into the catchment. The females lack that dark um, suffusion on the wings, but instead they're still coloured. They have a white false wing spot. It's actually not a, a pterostigma as such, um, but a patch of colour covering more than one cell. And the banded demoiselle has obviously green tinted wings, whereas the beautiful demoiselle tends to have brown tinted wings. Um, I always think brown is beautiful. Uh, tells me that's the beautiful demoiselle. Also to be, to be found um, alongside, invariably in fact, alongside banded demoiselles, um, though rather more localised, is the white-legged damselfly. And uh, this is, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, quite a pale blue damselfly. The white legs are expanded tibiae, which give the species its name. But it also has black where the other blue damselflies are blue. And instead of a, um, a snooker cue, this one's got a hockey stick. So the, uh, the thick black line there joining up with the one above. Um, curving round, so not quite a hockey stick, but uh, um, a hockey player instead of a snooker player, let's say. And unlike other damselflies, these have orange wing spots. The female um, lacks the blue coloration, rather whitish buff in colour, and with uh, usually with a rather reduced black patterning on the abdomen. And there's the distribution, again, rather more localised than the banded demoiselle, but doing quite well generally in, in uh, southern Britain. Along these fast flowing waters that are so common in Devon, uh, rivers and streams, Look out for the golden ring dragonfly males patrolling up and down, perching up fairly often, more so than you would expect hawkers to do, um, and sometimes wandering quite a way away from water. These are well named because the yellow, um, alternating broad and narrow yellow markings seem to form bands around the abdomen or rings. They're actually not quite, but they are bands of colour right across and they do have bold yellow stripes on the thorax and lovely emerald green eyes. Uh, the female has this amazing long ovipositor which sticks out beyond the tip of its abdomen and that makes her the longest British dragonfly and they lay eggs by bouncing up and down rather like a pogo stick into the gravels at the bottom of a, a watercourse and laying their eggs as they do so. A very westerly distribution for this, also occurring on some southern heathlands, but pretty widespread across Devon. So this chaser occurs generally on slow flowing water. Um, sometimes standing waters too. So as you'll see, it's a, a, f a newcomer to Devon. It's expanded quite a bit in range in England. And so maybe the name scarce chaser is not quite so appropriate these days. Blue chaser, maybe. Um, but it has spread and is probably more widespread across the south of the county than we think. It's quite hard to access some of the uh, particularly lowland river stretches where it may be occurring. 
but we've had records now um, in Torbay for a couple of years and it's even found its way to Cornwall. So likely to be turning up and well worth looking out for. So it has the dark wing bases of a chaser, although they're actually rather inconspicuous and sometimes hard to see. Um, it has lovely blue gray eyes, which are, make it very different to the black tailed skimmer, which has greenish eyes, dark green eyes. And often um, in males and almost invariably in females, dark wingtips as well. So this is the location where we first found it breeding in Devon, the Grand Western Canal. It had seemingly jumped over most of Somerset to reach here, although we now know it's quite widespread in the Somerset levels. So it may not have done it in one leap, but it was a fair distance from the Bristol area and in Purbeck in Dorset, where the nearest known populations were. So there's the distribution map in 2012 with quite a lot of red dots indicating new colonization over the last 20 years. And here's evidence, the first in fact, proven breeding evidence of scarce chaser in Devon. So along the Grand Western Canal, this tenoral sitting above its exuvia. And this exuvia, very similar to the other chasers, except it has these outrageously long curved spines on the top of its abdomen. So making it a very easy species to identify and in fact then to prove breeding at a location. This is a teneral, um, so lovely ochre coloration, a lot of yellow in the wings and those dark, smoky dark wingtips. But note also what I call the string of bells, the pattern of bell shapes down the abdomen, which is characteristic of this species. Exminster Marsh is, um, is a good location, or at least parts of it anyway, the uh, slow flowing drains there for scarce chaser, but also the ditch system more widely is the main location in Devon for the hairy dragonfly. So a small hawker type dragonfly found in the spring and early summer, it's quite a short flight period from April through to June. As you can see, the male has a hairy thorax and is rather brightly coloured. A pair of mating here, and you can see the female is also hairy on the abdomen too. And both of them showing quite a lot of yellow in the veins at the front of the wing. A very localised species in the southwest, very strong populations on the Somerset levels, but rather few places in Devon. And in fact, one extra spot, we know um, that there was a female laying eggs at Braunton Burrows recently. So a species that may well be uh, moving around. They found the Grand Western Canal in recent years. So one worth keeping an eye open for in the spring months. Ruddy data is something of an enigma in Devon. It's readily identified, provided you can get close enough to be sure, by its solid black legs. They really are black legs. If you find yourself wondering whether a data has got black legs or not, then it probably hasn't. The very bright red abdomen is rather distinctly wasted, so narrowing um, in the middle. And the front end, uh, particularly the face, is very obviously reddish, unlike the common data, which is rather dull brown at best. The female also has the black legs, of course, uh, otherwise looks very similar to a female common data. But if you can get close enough views, you'll see the black uh, across the top of the face comes down the sides a little way alongside the eyes. And they also have a black T-shape on the 
top of the thorax. So if you were looking down on it, you'll see a T-shape with a black collar behind the head. Distribution wise, though, it seems to be a very scarce migrant, mainly to Devon. We've had a few breeding locations over the years, but um, several of these have been lost. Um, and we're not sure whether it's still resident in the county. So well worth keeping an eye open for. Most of the records typically come in in August time. And these are probably migrants. They're nearly all males. Um, but uh, we may well still have some breeding at Brompton Burrows, for example. Heathland is a fantastic habitat for, well, a lot of wildlife, but where there are um, boggy areas or pools, these can be really good for dragonflies, essentially because the water is very acidic and fish find difficulty living in very uh, acidic water. So there are uh, no fish to predate them. So this is one of the typical heathland species, the keeled skimmer. It does find its way on Dartmoor where it occurs very widely on flushes and uh, boggy areas away from the high parts. So not in the blanket bog, but in the valley mires and lowland flushes of which there are many on Dartmoor. Rather fewer to be found, it has to be said, on Exmoor. And it also occurs on the East Devon pebble bed heaths in wet areas where this photograph was taken. So you can see the sort of areas where round leaf sundew also occurs. So it's a small skimmer, a little bit smaller than the black tailed and generally not going to be found in the same locations as black tailed. It has a completely blue abdomen, um, yellow wing spots as opposed to black in the black tailed skimmer. No dark in the wing bases, I'll say again, so it's not uh, a chaser. But the keel that gives it its name is this narrow line down the top of the abdomen. Not a very good feature and a really rather bad name. Uh, much better off being called, in my view, the Heathland skimmer. And there you can see its distribution very much um, concentrated in the southwest where we have um, some really good populations. Some sites you'll be able to see dozens and dozens of these in extensive boggy areas. The female and immature males will look the same, um, has a rather more obvious keel, a black line down the center, um, but she also has these cross marks as well, these black marks going across it. And a characteristic of skimmers uh, these yellow veins, the antinodal veins near the front of the wing and the data, common data, for example, lacks these. The thorax pattern does vary a little bit individually and this is an example of a rather um, contrasting thorax pattern. The small red damselfly is the smaller and rarer of our two red damselflies. And as the mnemonic says there, the small red is all red. So no black to be found on the tip of the um, abdomen. The legs and wing spots are a pinky red color. Uh, the top of the thorax is entirely black. And this is a specialist of some lowland heath areas and also the fringes of Dartmoor, although like the keel skimmer occurring in those lower sites, so not on the high moor. It also occurs on the East Devon pebble bed heaths at a few locations. But nationally scarce, uh, one of our red list species and um, to be treasured. This is an old clay pit at Small Hanger, southwest Dartmoor. Um, sad to say this is now a very large hole in the ground having been reworked for clay but the flushed areas here support used to support the small red damsel and also 
the scarce blue-tailed damselfly. So this is another um, redless species. It is very similar to blue-tailed damselfly, maybe on average a bit smaller, but certainly a lot scarcer. And it's a, a specialist of early successional stages in wetlands, be it ponds or streams. So it doesn't like too much vegetation to be around. So muddy areas around streams on Dartmoor, as well as some of the clay working sites, which have um, typically running water, but sometimes pools associated with them. So it has quite a close association in South Devon and in a few places in North Devon with the ball clay and China clay industries. So it's identified by having the blue right at the tip of the abdomen. So here you can see a slightly darker version with a little bit more black patterning, but it's segment nine that has the main blue with a little bit on segment eight. Compare that with a blue tailed male, which has segment eight showing the blue. It's uh, another very localized species occurring mainly in the southwest. Um, and we've got a reasonable number of sites around Dartmoor in particular. When they first emerge, the uh, females look like this, uh, a lovely golden orange phase. When they mature, they become a lot darker and drabber and actually quite difficult to spot in the vegetation. There is, however, a, a very rare blue form female which we've yet to see in Devon. Um, this one you can see has got sediment on the tip of its abdomen and also on its wings. So as you can imagine, things dipping their abdomen into um, plant material, rushes typically in this species, they will become coated in any sediment like clay particles that are in the water. In just a few places in Devon, there are short sections of um, shallow streams on the fringes of Dartmoor and on the East Devon Pebble Bed Heaths where the southern damselfly occurs. Southern damselfly is our rarest uh, damselfly species in the UK. It's a West European um, endemic species that's endangered and um, specially protected. So these streams are typified by, as I say, being shallow, relatively warm. They flow all year. They're often um, spring or flush um, fed. And the vegetation is typically Marsh St John's wort and bog pondweed. And Pruley Moor um, here is the most accessible of these, just off the A30 near Oakhampton. So this is a good place to go and see them where they are fairly secure. So here's the southern damselfly. It's a small blue damselfly. Um, the scientific name Mercuriali comes from a mercury mark on segment two. And it also has these rocket or spear shapes um, further down the abdomen, which are also characteristic. And there is the distribution map, one location on Anglesey, a few in southwest Wales, um, a few in Devon, a few in Dorset, um, one site in Oxfordshire, and all the rest are in the New Forest. So let's move up onto the very tops of Dartmoor and to a lesser extent Dartmoor, which has uh, very little by way of blanket bog. So this is a pool right on the high top of Dartmoor with a British Dragonfly Society field meeting. And we're looking for the specialities of these areas. So this one, the black darter, um, there are some populations in the lowlands on wet heathland, although not so much in Devon. Most of ours are found at a fair altitude in the Valley Myers and certainly on the blanket bog of Dartmoor. 
you can see here the males are completely black or almost completely black when they mature. Uh, when they start off, they're like this, the female, um, so rather ochre yellow with fairly extensive areas of black compared with the other darters. So they do have a, a, a unique black triangle on the top of the thorax, quite a lot of black along the sides of the abdomen. And if you're very close, you might be able to see there are three yellow spots in the black panel on the side of the thorax. So this is very much associated with the sphagnum, the bog mosses on moorland and heathland. As you can see, the distribution shows that upland and lowland heath uh, distribution in the UK and Ireland. We have rather more probably on Dartmoor than is shown there. Um, we also expect this to be one of a small suite of um, mainly northerly species that are suffering from climate change, we believe, um, along with this species, the common hawker. Um, and we have seen evidence of a significant decline in distribution at the local scale in the UK. Um, that's reflected in several um, European countries as well. And uh, it's possible that we may lose these species in southerly latitudes, like um, Devon, for example. So the common hawker is a terrible name for this species. It's not by any means the commonest hawker, unless you happen to be spending all your time on the tops of Dartmoor. Um, uh, moorland hawker or heathland hawker possibly would be more appropriate. It has a, a yellow costa, that wing vein at the front of the wings, not always easy to see unless it's at rest. And actually, you don't often see these at rest. They go and perch in out of the way places. They have eh, headlights, but not very bold, certainly not on main beam like the southern hawker. And they have paired spots down the abdomen, unlike the southern hawker. They don't have a golf tee or a triangle of any description, just a little yellow smudge. And there's the distribution. Actually, in the lowlands, probably much less common than that would suggest, because we have probably many misidentifications of this species. People seeing a hawker in late summer, um, which is almost certainly in many, on many occasions going to be a migrant hawker, and they're quite common, so people call them common hawker. Um, rather unfortunate. So you have to read between the lines a little bit, read between the dots of that map. But as you can see on Dartmoor and Exmoor, um, it occurs. And these are the main locations. Well, they're very scarce in lowland Devon. OK, so that's a, a run through of our species. If you want more information, then go to the BDS website, british-dragonflies.org.uk, um, look on the Devon site, the Devon pages, and you'll find a link to this document, which I produced in um, early 2021. So there's uh, a detail in there of all of the species that have occurred in Devon, and will give you many um, of the locations and also where those are. So please do investigate that. And uh, of course, um, hopefully join the British Dragonfly Society and send in records. Um, that's uh, one of the things we're all about, as well as dragonfly conservation. OK, I hope you've enjoyed that. And I hope you enjoy watching dragonflies, um, preferably in Devon during the summer months. Thank you.